Welcome to the most anticipated episode of my obscure game review series by far, Hunter Dan's Bow Fishing Survival Gauntlet. That's a bit of a mouthful. Speaking of mouthfuls, I'm well aware that everybody's been foaming at the mouth for this one. According to a survey I conducted, this is a legendary title among most gamers, sample size of that survey just being me, so it's no shock. Now, I've never fired a bow nor caught a fish before, especially not at the same time, but I can safely say that nobody in the world cares more about bow fishing than I do. I can quote any given sentence from the first paragraph of the Wikipedia page on bow fishing because that's just what being an expert lets me do. According to which, there's currently a bow fishing renaissance going on. Let me tell you, bow fishing in 2024 is going to be nothing like it was in 2023, but it will likely resemble bow fishing as it was in 2008 given current trends, weather forecasts, and plans alignments. Oh, right, I'm talking about a game. Hunter Dan's Bow Fishing Survival Gauntlet is a premier fishing, bowing, gauntleting, and hunting game of 2004, every genre of game in one. It has the distinctive honor of both releasing to the thunderous applause of about seven people, and being considered the uncontested game of the year by the homeless man I met when I was last in Seattle. He was a pretty nice guy, and apparently his toaster running Windows 10 was able to run this game out of the box without the need for tweaks. On my end, my Windows 10 refrigerator had no issue installing this game and booting it up. Native widescreen support up to 3840 by 2160 too, no need for external tweaks. I only caught two technical issues, misaligned text in the menus and my intrusive shadow play prompt. No idea how to fix the former, but the latter can easily be fixed by covering up and editing with Hunter Dan. So I can safely say that I've covered a fishing game that runs on modern systems better than Splinter Cell Conviction. All of this combined proves that Hunter Dan's Bowfishing Survival Gauntlet, often abbreviated as HDBSG, is as timeless as Hunter Dan, the beloved mascot, himself. Despite that, it's been abandoned where for almost two decades. Luckily, you can currently find a copy on archive.org. Usually I don't name my sources, but I strongly doubt anyone would come after me or the site for this one. Hunter Dan would likely want nothing more than for me to spread the word of his gospel anyhow. Maybe you need a refresher. Who is Hunter Dan? Well, that's a silly question. He's the most famous bow fisher ever. He practically invented both bows and fishing, and at the same time, too. Back in his day, the olden times, 2002, he was about to become the face of bow fishing. He would have been the next Bill Cosby, the next Mark Rogowski, the next Dane Cook. But he fell off the radar. His fall was largely thanks to bow fishing becoming obsolete, since early on in 2003, humanity invented not needing to fish anymore. In a desperate attempt to relive his glory years, he decided to speedrun making a game about himself. And here we are, playing it today. He promised that Hunter Dan, as a mascot, would be able to compete with the famous Zool, and that his catchphrases such as, That's it, time to head on back. And, Welcome to the world Switch back to drive and keep the by pressing the mouse button. If you catch the boat with the W, S, A, and D keys. Would become iconic worldwide. Hey, it's a shame he never caught on with witty one-liners like those. It's possible the issue with Hunter Dan as a mascot is that he never caught on with witty one-liners like those. It's possible the issue with Hunter Dan as a mascot is due to his presence mostly being in a whopping two cutscenes. As far as I'm aware, we aren't playing as him. Of course, this is unconfirmed and likely would have been addressed in Hunter Dan's Bowfishing Survival Gauntlet 2005, or at least a future entry in the multiverse. There's a lot about the series that's purely speculative. Nobody archived any of it, tragically enough, but the forum post would go on for thousands and thousands of pages debating whether or not Hunter Dan actually was in a Vermont and if he was responsible for the bite of 87. He's got eyes like he's a backup singer for an instrumental song, so it's safe to assume he did it. Jumping off from that, I should note that this game was originally going to be the start of a hexology. You know how they make a farming simulator game every year because farming undergoes significant revolutions on a yearly basis? Well, bow fishing is exactly the same. You never know what kind of bow or what kind of fish they'll be using. I hear back in 1985 there was a brief period where it was more optimal to use a fish to catch bows out of the water. It's fascinating stuff, the history of sports like this. So how could a video game adapt such a frantic, rapidly innovating field? Easy. Make a regular fishing game, add a bow and hunger meter, and sell it to confused grandparents. Doesn't seem like it was too successful, but Hunter Dan did end up releasing a line of marketable fish action figures, so it all evens out. We'll come back to this later, as it's time to dive right in like how our arrows dive into the dolphins on total accident. 
For a start, this is a bow fishing game. Can't say the title isn't descriptive. There are numerous modes to play, which I'll elaborate on later, but regardless of which you pick, your goal is fundamentally consistent. Bow fish to your heart's content. Well, except for the endangered species. The manual believes that their lives trump yours. Screw you, US Fish and Wildlife Services shill. You can't tell me what to do in the Amazon, God's dumping ground. Now, this game is a first-person shooter, so it fits in well on my channel. It's just one where your primary goal is shooting largely harmless critters with a slow, awkward, unwieldy artifact that can be dated back to the pre-Cambrian. The bow has a difficult-to-learn arc, and I have to admit, slowly getting used to it and landing more and more shots was genuinely satisfying. Yeah, I'll confess, I got hits of dopamine from landing shots, especially when they're long distance or on smaller fish. This alone proves that this is more worthy of being a sport than cricket. Your arrows also arc differently in the air and in the water, which is something I needed to mentally adjust to and account for. Landing shots can be surprisingly difficult, but the game is mechanically rather generous, so in about 10 or so seconds, you can try for another shot, no consequences. You do have a limited number of arrows, borderline survival horror number to reuse all my running gag descriptors, however they're effectively tethered to your bow and won't break or vanish unless you're trying to catch a real tough cookie of a fish. Whether you miss a shot or land a shot, you have to reel your arrow back in. Should you hit something that isn't an aquatic organism, like your buddy Dave, you can just mash click to reel your arrow back in, with no penalties outside of the lost time. It seems vaguely random how much thrilling it takes to get your line back, so hope you aren't in the middle getting eaten by piranhas or something. Also, land animals instantly die to the bow or resist it through the sheer power of will, no in-betweens. Once you successfully land a shot on a fish, you get forced into this tension mini-game. Most of my footage is probably me stuck in this mode, but I guess I'll find out in editing, right me? Blow me? Anyways, this is typically easier than bowfishing fish in a fishbowl. It's all about managing the height of the tension meter. The higher the tension, the faster the fish tires out, but the higher the risk of the line breaking. So there's slight depth to this mechanic in the form of risk versus reward. Larger fish put more tension on the line on average, so they take considerably longer to tire out to compensate. In fact, if the fish is over 200 pounds, it may flee, breaking your line. You will need to shoot it again and successfully beat the minigame to retrieve both the fish and your lost arrow. I don't dislike like this mini game, and I'd really only say it needs more complexity, perhaps more variety in fish behavior, or maybe another mechanic to juggle alongside managing the fish's exhaustion meter. I do like that aggressive play speeds up the mini game quite significantly. Aggressive fishing is the name of the game, and my ska band. Still, I got sick of it over time. There's too little variation, too little to keep it mechanically interesting once you've mastered the art of keep bar high but not red. As for the fish, the majority are doomed to slowly swim in circles for the rest of eternity, an enviable existence. However, certain fish are more erratic than others, and if you even try to dodge your arrows the moment you fire them, those fish become Mickey D's fillets of fish. So there's a bit of variety to the fish AI, more so than Call of Duty Ghosts, but it's rather subtle. In general, the fish are not too hard to hit, but not too easy to hit. So there is consistent satisfaction to be had from landing a shot. The only issue is that certain fish have rather tiny hitboxes like they're playing as Raymoon, a fishing game. Or like a reverse fishing game where you're the fish. But they're the... Uh, whatever, you know what I mean. In addition, I was initially having depth perception issues, which may not be too surprising given I'm lucky to have two eyes. You can enable an arrow cam in the options menu, which looks like this for some reason. And the actual arrow cam looks like this, a close-up cinematic view of the arrow lazily plopping onto the riverbed. Goofy, yes. Helpful, yes. Erotic, no. It makes it easier to judge the arc and definitely improve my aim in the long run, though it felt more awkward when I missed. Still, it's a welcome feature it should have been on by default. Since there is a survival mode, I'll get to that shortly, they shoehorned a bunch of sponsored doohickeys into the game. You have a map, which I never needed that badly, which is why it's a lucky break that the map is covered up by a bunch of links to websites that probably give out free Russian malware. Hey, there's no beating free. But as an outsider looking in, this doesn't seem realistic. Adware? On our physical maps? That's dystopian, I didn't think the Bofester Christ Hunter Dan would approve of that. Maybe this was something that only happened in 2004 and would have been passed out in the 2005 version. Whatever's the case, you can't access these codes anymore and even the Wayback Machine only got me three codes of 18. 
But I'm not just a leading worldwide bowfishing Wikipedia article expert, I'm also a hacker. The game's files are straight up sitting out in the open, so you can effectively edit whatever you want. Hunter Dan is open and honest that way, don't ask him where the naughty children go though. In the respective folder for each level, you can find these maps formatted in stages as .dds images. All you need to do is swap the first and last versions of these map images. Bam. Hacked. You and I are probably the first people to see these maps since the game's release in 2004. Never say you weren't around to personally witness any massive societal advancements. You do have a couple other gadgets, though I don't have nearly as much to say about them. You've got a useless compass, which is a different size depending on how many times you hit the C key. Never needed it, so moving on. There's binoculars, which actually did come in useful a few times. They function weirdly though, there's a several second delay before they zoom in and you can't adjust them nor zoom out. Like the rest of the kit, they are sponsored and I'm definitely not buying these. You've got a knife in survival mode too. We'll get to that. Boy, we'll get to that. Let's change topic for a minute to address these graphics that would have been amazing in 1998. Bowfishing Survival released in 2004 and it's not going to win any awards for its visuals beyond what the aforementioned homeless man gave it. I actually think it looks fairly decent for a title that is statistically almost certainly shovelware. Actually can we start calling shovelware fishing games netware? Let's do that from now on. Bowfishing Survival has an early 3D nature aesthetic going for it, a very specific aesthetic that I have a strong respect for, especially when it's trying to emulate jungle. It's the same reason I like the kind of art they put as a thumbnail for jungle music compilations on YouTube. Oh, jungle music, I get the connection, I think. Anyways, there are three levels in a game, each of them having a unique environment. The Amazon has a sparse but ambitious jungle. It's dense where it matters and surprisingly atmospheric. It's easily the best looking level in the game all around, and I can understand why the peppermint bark I keep ordering is getting lost here. The tropical island can be the ugliest level at its worst, though it has a neat volcano set piece and a lot of hidden little details. A lot of these details are skeletons and weird shrunken head totem poles. Small things, but they both add a sense of mystery to the landscape. Most other netware games probably wouldn't bother with these unnecessary sprinkles of flavor. Too bad about the holes in the water and the terrain generation getting rather ugly at points. And lastly, the Tourney Lake. Well, it's got a nice lake feel. It's large and varies from being quite lively to quite quiet. I don't have much to say about it, though I like the mood overall. My biggest issue is how obvious the limits of the engine are here. The lake is respectable in scale, sure, but that scale means that you can see the trees and terrain pop in half a mile off. I appreciate a sense of scale in a map like this, so I'd take this pop in over the map being cramped. Still, it's hard not to notice. In general, the soundscape and atmospheric wildlife greatly help with the liveliness. They actually render out the bugs and birds, another detail I figured a netware title wouldn't bother with. There's constant animal noise, the sound of water splashing, easy listening music, you know, all the things you'd expect to hear in nature. I do think the audio mixing could be better because the crickets are louder than the volcano erupting half a mile away. The volcano should be what splits my eardrums in half, not the crickets. That's the only thing in this entire game that's inaccurate to real life. Also, being underwater uses overly toilety sound effects. Ah oh well, I guess it's overall fairly impressive for the time and budget. All things considered, this is the most immersive bowfishing game I've ever played. The soundscape and visuals together create a fairly decent atmosphere. Yeah, it's dated and flawed, it's not all sunshine and rainbow fishes. There's distant graphics like they're underwater, grass floating, holes in the water, titanic chunks of fish clipping, and Hunter Dan could be hotter. That sentence had a vague unintentional groove to it, but anyways, being scuffed and dated isn't a damning thing. The surreality from its datedness is a pleasant bonus, at least for me. Only adding to that surrealism is a sparse distant terrain, abrupt map cutoffs, the early 3D water effects and caustics, and the models of the fish being disproportionately detailed. I confess, I'm charmed by the presentation, both for the things it does right and for the things it does poorly. Like I said, this game was probably netware, but despite that, I found myself slowing down and appreciating the environment 
experience an atmosphere from time to time. I doubt it'd blow anyone away, I'm probably just easy to please with games like this. As long as it's not butt ugly and I get a sense of atmosphere and being deep into nature, I'm more than content. And hey, Hunter Dan snuck in a secret feature. The game's audio files are out in the open on dry land like the elusive teak to leak. Now, I wouldn't alter the game's audio, would I? Well, I ruthlessly hate the sound of crickets chirping, so I replaced them with something more to my taste. Chirp, 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 chirp. Okay, so I originally brought this up purely for the sake of humor, but this led to interesting and amusing discoveries in the game's files. I like the sounds a player makes when he catches a fish. Yes. Alright. Yeah. And I like H8 Spooky. If any of you can figure out where the sound is heard in-game, I'll give you a hundred Monopoly money dollars. Assuming it's even in the game in the first place, there's a lot of mysterious content in the game's files, particularly the assets for an unused cruise ship cutscene, and an entire folder full of disproportionately gruesome tribal imagery. This is absolutely bizarre, and I couldn't find out how any of this tied into the game. Like H8 Spooky, all of these file names start with H8. What is H8 an acronym for? Digging deeper, I learned this game had two developers, Great Outdoors Multimedia, who did not develop any other games, and Eevee Interactive. So maybe this is promo material left in the files? Well, I assume so too, but Eevee did not make any game that remotely resembled this afterwards. Their next game was totally close to that of a tribal massacre though, a lawnmower racing game. Honestly, what is happening here? Why do I feel like I've stumbled upon forbidden knowledge? Where's the cutting room floor page for this game? It all makes me feel like I missed something obvious or accidentally skipped the cutscene. Even so, why does such an otherwise innocent game feature hidden imagery of this freaky guy or have a cutscene featuring Hunter Dan talking to you before a cruise ship explodes? Yeah, he's there, so the cruise ship cutscene in particular is actually connected to the game and isn't totally random and disconnected. It's clearly him because he's talking in the audio file in the folder anyways. Frankly, we'll probably never know. It's truly a mystery rival that of Jack the Ripper. I'm genuinely fascinated by this insanely obscure mystery I've seemingly stumbled upon, so if you have any insight to share, feel free to lend it to me. I doubt we'll get answers, but speculation can be fun. And earlier when I was talking about maps, keen-eyed viewers may have noticed a flash of something. Yes, there are mysterious marks on the map on the Tourney Lake level. I investigated these and couldn't find anything or piece anything together. I'm a terrible secret hunter, so I probably missed something. I'm sure some of you find the prospect of a secret undiscovered and undocumented for two decades to be extremely enticing. Assuming this really is some sort of secret, good luck to anyone who chooses to seek it out. I only have so much time and patience, so I have to pass the torch to one of the three people on the planet who have reached this point in the video. So yeah, it's statistically unlikely anyone will find this out. Anyways, while I'm dogpiling random things in this one section, enjoy my Crash Percent speedrun world record. Welcome to the World Record Tournament. Explore at your leisure and try to bag the biggest fish you can. This game is more stable than you'd expect, though I did find this crash on total accident while being a goofball. I also got revived by a fish after drowning once, though I wasn't recording and I was unable to replicate it afterwards. I like to imagine the fish administered CPR. Turns out, fish love Hunter Dan, but women fear him. Back to the gameplay, the main menu lets you choose between tournaments and survival. I started with the tournaments, which are a variety of smaller, self-contained fishing challenges taking place in one of the three aforementioned maps. I primarily mess around in a grand tourney mode, which gives you 20 minutes to catch as many non-forbidden fish as possible, primarily being scored based on their collective weight. It's simple and modestly enjoyable for a while, though I think the timer is overly long. There's a scoreboard to compare your score to, but obviously there's no online, and I trip over the in-game world record on my first attempt. Since nobody bowfishes, maybe this is accurate to real life. In fact, here's my best grand tourney score after a bit of practice. 3,591.5 pounds of fish. I wish I had that much fish, honestly, I love fish. Beat that and you'll win a hypothetical hat that says women fear me, fish fear me. Scavenger hunt mode, on the other hand, is almost impossible to beat, in quotes. It's about catching as many different kinds of fish as you can, but the record is 10 fish. I don't think any map in this game has more than 10 fish, excluding the forbidden fishies. I think the fish you find are randomized to an extent, which might also mean you 
can literally lose runs to RNG. What a well-designed mode. I played one round of it and never came back. Finally, there's the world record mode. This one is more like a free roam mode than anything else. There's no time pressure and you're free to bowfish as much as you desire, which probably isn't very much. Your goal is to catch the largest fish possible of any species you want. There are visible size variations in the fish, so it's at least not a random guessing game. Hilariously, most of the records I got were purely accidental. I'm literally just some random guy accidentally breaking every fishing record on a scenic trip. Either I'm a prodigy, or it really is true that nobody cares about bow fishing. I mostly booted this up to explore the map's pressure free. This is probably the closest to the actual fishing experience anyways. Just out on your... camo bow? W would fish get fooled by that? Taking in the atmosphere and occasionally accidentally shooting a dolphin. Normal fisherman things. Not much more to add here. Guys, how do I beat this score? I've never seen a grass carp remotely close to being that big. I should also mention the night modes, which are just the grand tourney and world record modes, but at night. No scavenger hunt, they knew that sucked. Still, that's bang for your buck. They took familiar modes and changed the lighting, so now the game plays completely differently. It's more like an RTS now. I actually do kind of like the nighttime atmosphere in Amazon and on the island. There's different lighting, unique fish, and new ambience, so they at least put some effort into making these feel different. The lighting is weirdly broken on the tourney lake, though. I don't care for that one too much. Beyond that, it's a lot harder to see. When I booted into this mode for the first time, I immediately caught one of fish that shall not be named. These are ultimately just clutter to make it feel like the game has more modes than it actually does, and should have just been individually selectable levels instead. Before you hop in, you get to choose between one of three regions, which has an effect on the gameplay. If you do the Amazon or Tourney Lake, you're stuck on a boat the whole time. The boat controls like you're fighting off a demon possessing you while you're rollerblading on ice. Though that might actually imply that movement is happening. Plus, it's too fast in its default mode. You have a second mode on the boat called the Trolling Position, which is a funny name for it. It greatly slows the boat down, but it goes a little too far in the opposite direction. You're either way too fast or way too slow. There's no happy middle ground. Call me crazy, but I think decent precision movement would be very handy in a game about precision. I can't say that word, that's weird. Overall, I'm not a big fan of this boat, especially since it's not a fan boat. It's far from the worst vehicle I've piloted in a game, though it's certainly among the most sluggish and awkward. On the other hand, if you choose a tropical island, you're on foot. The on-foot movement in this game is unique in a distinctive way. Hunter Dan evidently takes after the long-extinct mountain goat, and with his cloven hooves, he flies up 89 degree inclines like a rocket. That's not all, though. There's a volcano in the distance in this level, so naturally I decide I've had enough of the fishing life and want more of the Moloch life. I send it up the volcano like it's an elevator. Why don't those idiots do this to climb Everest? And I jumped inside. I jumped in a volcano and survived. This is the sheer power of Hunter Dan. Even the molten embers of the deepest, darkest hellfire cannot contain him. From there, I clambered my way out of the volcano, swanned over a couple hundred feet into the lava, and went for a casual little swim. Finally, I emerged to put on my sunscreen because the UV's a little bit intense out there today. That's the daily life of Hunter Dan, the strongest bow fisherman. Yeah, they didn't play test this. Lastly, we have survival mode. This is the big selling point of this game, at least I think. Starting this mode, you get a cutscene. You play as Hunter Jet, being sent into dangerous territory to do something, I don't know. Hunter Dan didn't say anything about fishing in a mission briefing, so I blanked out. It's irrelevant anyways, because our hero's plane gets struck by lightning, whereupon which he uses a lifeboat to escape. All of this told through a slideshow, because Hunter Dan is all natural, none of that moving picture poppycock. From there, you're thrown right into the mode with no stated objective. It's just about reaching the end of the river without dying, so at least that's easy to understand. Now, unlike in the tournament modes, our character has a magic ability to starve to death if he doesn't eat fish for five minutes. So the fate of America is in good hands. Catching fish hasn't changed beyond a new option to either eat or toss them once you reel them in. Eating fish plays a bizarre animation of your character flailing a knife through the air like it's gold source. The knife is exclusive to this mode. Rather than being used to preserve your honor, it's used for this animation and nothing else. I don't think it has any, like, proper non-cosmetic uses, so it's strange that you can even equip it. 
Jumping off from that is Hunger. It's a simple bar that decrements over time and kills you once it reaches zero. Hunger is bizarrely designed as the size of your cats is relevant to the amount of hunger restored. This is a total head scratcher because isn't that like the most obvious feature to add? As it stands, a 3 pound piranha is just as filling as a 500 pound crocodile. Realism is this game's strong suit until it isn't most of the time. What, do you think this is some kind of survival mo- Oh wait, it is. On the other hand, you can toss fish instead of eating it. Tossing a fish doesn't refer to a legendary dolphin technique that cannot be described in polite company, but rather the ability to give up the fish for literally no benefit. The manual says it's more optimal than eating if you're under attack by predators, but the invisible ninja knife fight animation when you eat a fish is only 2 seconds long. There's no reason to toss the fish. At all. Add on to this the other new mechanic. Boat health. A lot of the fish in this mode attack your boat, doing chip damage that slowly accumulates, and actually does have a visual effect on the boat itself. A cute touch. Well, would accumulate. Lucky break, this sloop has magical regeneration powers and heals in close proximity to steam. The steam represents checkpoints, which is odd, though I guess is a vaguely elegant way of doing it. Even so, you can get annihilated by piranhas, which you will have to plow straight through at some point since it's a frickin' river, what else are you gonna do? Well, the solution to your ever-present piranha problem is to just shoot an arrow at a nearby surface. That scares them off and buys you plenty of time to reel it back in and shoot it again. I cannot believe I had to figure out a way to exploit fish AI. This might be intentional though, as I'm genuinely unsure how you're intended to avoid damage otherwise. At least I can say I'm missing on purpose. Speaking of that boat, this mode takes place on a boat that invokes an unparalleled sense of adventure in the player by moving about as fast as a slow boat from China that ships me my Nesso berries. If it's any consolation, this is the sole mode that uses this dinghy with speed that can easily be measured in natcock circumferences per second. It doesn't help that this map is full of currents that push this thing all over the place. In fact, in level 5, there's a brief segment where the currents are so strong you're borderline stuck in place, unless you get into the trolling position, which usually slows you down. Why that fixes the problem is yet another mystery to add to the pile. I'd say that this is bad level design, but there would actually need to be both levels and design for that to exist in the first place. Since I've mentioned it, the map is just the Amazon level from the tournament mode, except completely arbitrarily split up into 8 levels. Some of these take 10 minutes, others take about 2. They're effectively checkpoints that refill your resources. I would complain about these being tension breakers, but I really shouldn't. They've made this go by faster. After all, all you're doing is going from one end of this long, winding, linear, snaking path to another. Occasionally, you get to briefly depart from your permanent state of siesta to shoot a fish, maybe shoot around them if you're feeling spicy. All the while, you're drifting along like the toaster in Hunter Dan's bathtub, in a boat that would be outran by my grandma. It's one big straight line and it's hard to get turned around. There's no threat of being lost or stranded, so you don't even have that potential tension. Everything looks the same, so it's extra tedious. It's rather hilarious that hacking into the system and giving myself the map ultimately made me dread this more. However, there is one new thing that appears later in this mode. Snakes. Except they're not regular snakes, they're fucking dinosaurs. I am enamored by the size of these lads. They really caught me off guard, which I'll give this mode credit for. Congratulations, game. I felt emotion when I suddenly spotted a titanoboa peering at me through the bushes. Pat on the back, slow clap, kiss on the lips. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't do that again, that was dusty. And your reward for enduring this? Honestly, I'll let you experience it for yourself. Oh my gosh, we wondered if the world would ever see you again. Not many people survived the Amazon to tell about it. And by the looks of you and your gear, <laughs> you've got some real stories to share. Come on, let's get you out of that thing before it sinks. Uh, hey, is that a poison dart? <laughs> Yep, that's it. Drop right back to the menu like a sack of potatoes, too. Hunter Dan congratulates you, desperately tries to convey human emotion, and I guess acknowledges that you've been poisoned just before you pass out. In hindsight, it's hilarious I made that Bill Cosby joke since I wrote that before I completed this mode. You've been through hell, now have a roofie. I respect what this mode set out to do. Too bad it's a bowfishing survival gauntlet equivalent of a tactical corridor shooter and sleep medication. Unless you count this cutscene as a reward, that would be very generous of you, I'm sure your grandmother would be proud of you, there is no reward for beating this mode. Hunter Dan is all about the pride and accomplishment, I guess. 
Yeah, this mode isn't worth it. It's somewhat innovative, maybe. 2004 was long before survival was a trend in game design, but even if we want to go that route, it's not well done, as hunger may as well be a fish bloodlust meter. It's too bare bones, uninteresting, and lacking suspense. I ultimately had way more fun in the tournament modes. Play those instead of this half-baked survival mode. Please. We're into the concluding thoughts section now, but this was only the beginning of the tale of Hunter Dan and his quest to release a line of fish action figures. It's also the end of that tale, given the lack of sequels, and the fact that Hunter Dan is out of business. Well, still, this is likely the best title in the bowfishing genre, though like the Grand Tourney mode, it's a bit lacking in the competition department. Objectively, this isn't a particularly good game, but I have an odd soft spot for it. It's a mildly spicy piece of netware, and why I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, it's about as inoffensive as it gets. It's a humble little time capsule largely lost to the annals of time. It's technically free and easy to get running, so it's a fine way to pass a couple hours exploring the slightly serial maps, having some laughs at the jankiness, and netting a high score in a grand tournament. I don't have much to be harsh about. I didn't care for the survival mode, sure, but I would call it boring more so than suffering. Suffering is like the lowest points in games like Thief 4, 7554, and Marathon. At some points, those games made me want to quit playing entirely. With this game, nothing made me want to quit, and I simply played until I felt like I didn't have much more to do. I play games not to suffer, so that actually puts Bowfishing Survival Gauntlet surprisingly high up on my list of games. It's fine, though it would be more of an ironic recommendation than anything else. It doesn't substantially outstay its welcome, and the flaws are far more amusing than insufferable. That's about the best thing you can hope for with a title like this. Now, since you've come this far, you get to know that this video is a bit of a late April Fool's joke. Don't be fooled, I haven't been making this video for that long, I've just wanted to make a shorter, half-serious review of a fishing game, and I missed the dedicated day of the year to do that. I hope I've done Hunter Dan's Bowfishing Survival Gauntlet justice, because it's borderline undocumented. It arguably tops Mars 3D in how unknown it is, and Mars 3D only ever saw an extremely limited third-party release two decades after being scrapped. Bowfishing Survival Gauntlet occupies a different end of the obscure game Abyss. It saw a proper physical release, yet became so forgotten that it's difficult to find physical copies. Sites such as Giant Bomb have little to no information, screenshots, or footage of it, and I'll possibly be the third person on YouTube to ever document this game. I was beaten to the punch by a VTuber, hilariously. Not really into VTubers, but I have to say, I respect a woman with shitty back catalog taste in games like mine. Ultimately, what I'm saying is, I wanted to be the first person to ever write an actual review for this game, even if I just spent half the video cracking jokes. Anyways, that's all for today. In the future, look forward to a big pair of shmups about social media in the cosmos, a third-person shooter chronicling elemental robots, and dusk. Here's hoping Hunter Dan visits you in your sleep. Wait, actually, that's probably not a good thing at all, given his track record. Well, should you survive that, I'll see you soon. Toodles. the left mouse button to reel in.